something else I was like, show this as a promotion as well. <laughs> Gives us again um, an idea about how um, portraits differ for men versus women. Um, and this is one of my favorites. This is Isabella Dusty. And here is a, um, a very strong female ruler known as one of the great patrons of the Renaissance. And in this case, probably a woman who had something to say about what her portrait looked like. And what she had to say was, I'm 50, and I don't want to look like that. <laughs> because at the time this was painted, she was 50. <clears throat> Looking pretty good for 50, right? As opposed to, Jim, this is the with Carolyn Dial, again, works at all, right? You don't see women getting old, right? Or very rarely, right? And again, even when they're making the decisions, we also see that there's this idealized way that even they're thinking about their own um, appearance. Okay, so now let's look at some ideal beauties. So these ideal beauties, we've been looking at a series of images, right, of women who have idealized features in line with beauty standards of the day, right? But they're still real women. Right? They still represent individuals, even if we don't know very much about them as individuals or personalities, right? Well. There is a, a group of images, and, and they start in the 15th century and then become more popular in the 16th century, where there's this second category of beautiful women images, that they are represented principally or exclusively because of beauty, right? And there's been a lot of debate. So who are these women? Are these portraits? And if they are portraits, are these, a, are these wives, are these mistresses, are these courtesans, right? And again, to give you a sense, one of the images that is put on the poster, right, is one of these ideal beauties. Now, these are from the 15th century. These are Botticelli. Um, and what we see with Botticelli here, again, is these are, again, tied to Petrarch in that um, Petrarch, when he wrote his poems, right, his beloved Laura had died, right, and so his poems were about trying to keep her alive through poetry. Um, and there's actually a very famous painting, it was allegedly painted of her, um, by a Sienese artist, Simone Martini, that has been lost, right? And so everybody always gets excited, like, oh, maybe this, we found it, or in the Renaissance, they're like, ooh, this might be Laura, we finally have an image of her, right? So part of what was also going on here is Petrarch is using his poems to kind of fix the idea of his beloved, of this beauty for eternity. And Simone Martini was trying to do the same thing in a portrait. And so there kind of becomes this rivalry, who can do it better? Can poetry do it better? Or can painting do it better? Right? So we see that, for example, with Bonicelli, he again is looking at you know, all of the ideals that Petrarch sets down and applying them to these totally fictionalized women to sort of argue, well, you can write about them, but I can bring the beloved more to life. I can bring this beauty more to life. Um, so this challenge of painters to outdo poets. This also comes from a challenge to antiquity. Um, there is a, an ancient painter named Zuxus. Right? Um, and one of the sort of the famous stories about him is he goes to paint Helen of Troy, right? But he can't use just one woman. He needs to take several women and the most beautiful features of each woman to create Helen of Troy, because she's the most beautiful woman, and you obviously are not going to find an average, everyday woman who looks like that, right? And that's even hearing Lola in his dialogue as he's going on and on about all of these different features. He basically admits that you can't find a real woman that has all of those things, right? Even though as he's setting it up as a prescription for beauty, he's saying, like, well, it's not really achievable anyway, right? So, so Botticelli does these in the 15th century, and then what happens in the early 16th century, um, what we see is this sort of category of ideal beauties becoming very, very popular in Venice. Right? Um, and often they're called the belle, which just means beautiful, right? And one of um, the most famous of these is Giorgione's Laura. Now, name Laura, right? been some debate about this. But if we had to guess, or if we had to make some um, association or assignment of who this woman is, who might she be? Are there clues that tell us who she might be? Well, who is she probably not? Especially with, you know, right? So, she's probably not a wife. 
right? Although that's been one of the things that's been advanced, right? And Laura, this title is given to it later. We don't know if this is what Giorgione gave to it, right? And part of it is because she's got Laurel behind her. So, and also people thought, like, oh, well, maybe this is supposed to be Petrarch's beloved, and so we'll call her Laura, right? So, if she's a real woman, who is she probably? She's got to be a mistress or a courtesan, right? Especially in Venice, right? The, the famed courtesans of Venice, right? And, you know, and the thing is also Laura was actually a name that courtesans took a lot in Venice, right? But does she have to be a real woman? Because what we see is countless images of just beauty, right? These aren't supposed to be real women. These are supposed to be about the painter showing that they can capture beauty, right? And Titian, the Flora, she's called Flora, but, you know, so maybe there's sort of a mythological angle, but it's really more of like just beauty and sensual beauty, right? Um, I think this is a, a portrait by um, Bartolomeo Veneto, sometimes associated with Lucrezia Borgia, um, who has such a bad reputation, I'm sure that's why it gets associated with it. But again, not likely to be real women, right? And sometimes you know, people say, oh, well, they're the courts and portraits, but again, probably not portraits of anyone, right? And kind of the, the master, again, of these is Titian. We see Titian both doing sort of this and then women in contemporary clothing. And what's interesting about that is in Venice, unlike Florence, where we saw all those images of women who we know a lot of their names, we've been able to discover over time their identities. In Venice, there are not a lot of surviving portraits of women. There are surviving portraits of men, but it doesn't seem like they actually did that, that Venetian women commissioned a lot of portraits, or Venetian men commissioned a lot of portraits of their wives. But we do get these, which again are just meant to be ideal views, right? To show off the talent um, of the painter. Um, and one of the greatest, um, Palma Vecchio. And we also know from his, um, his records, um, that these weren't even necessarily commissions either, that he would just make a whole bunch of them to kind of sell on the art market. That, so again, there was a really ready um, audience for, again, just these lovely, sensuous images of beauty. So again, this idea of the painter showing off what they can do, that they can create ideal beauty, that, you know, this isn't even really woman, this is about the beauty of art, right? The beauty of these women represent the beauty of their art, right? So we're no longer in real woman land. So then we start to run into some problems that you don't necessarily run into with male portraits. Now, here is a portrait by Carmen Danino called Antea. Um, and again, this is a name given to it later. Antea was yet another um, name that was frequently given to courtesans. Um, and this image, again, is often seen either as, oh, it's a courtesan, or um, again, is this just the beauty of a woman standing in for the beauty of Parmigianino's art? Or even, well, maybe this is Parmigianino's mistress. That kind of gets wrapped up in this, too, that these beautiful women are the mistresses of the artist, that they become the creation of theirs. Yeah? What is it with the hand position? I've noticed that like, most of them have those two fingers together. I mean, I know when you have the male and female, like, yeah, I can make something up. But I'm going to tell you that I don't know. But I think, again, it just the, it tends to be the, the position of the hand, I think it's just show off the fingers a lot of the time. But I don't know why they're specifically this. You know, in this one, she's actually hooking her finger through her chain, through her neck, kind of calling attention to that. But I don't know anything about um, that the way they're separated, like that kind of spot. Right? So if anyone has any light, just shut on that. Yeah. So. Right, so we've got Antea here. So, who's to say, though, that this isn't a woman whose name was just lost? Who's to say that this isn't? I mean, she could be an upstanding Renaissance wife. 